Just ahead, there's another edition of the Florida Roundtable, a service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks. I'm Reagan Smith, Public Affairs Director of the Florida News Network. And I am Executive Producer Michael Yaffe. Michael, today we continue to observe the 75th anniversary of World War II. We're going to talk about a man from Florida, born and raised, 94 years young, lives in Orlando. One bomber, 10 men, and their harrowing escape from Nazi-occupied France. The story of the Coffin Corner Boys and Captain George W. Stark. Stay put. The Florida Roundtable begins following these messages. There's no question you need omega-3s. But which form should you take, fish oil or krill oil? Scientists have debated this for years. Luckily, there's a new solution to satisfy everyone. It's called Krill Omega 50 Plus. It combines ultra-pure fish oil and joint-soothing krill oil together in just one tiny pill. It's so powerful, it can promote the health of your heart and your arteries. And if that wasn't enough, it can also boost your joint comfort in just days. We're so sure Krill Omega 50 Plus will work for you. We'll even send you a free bottle to put to the test. The debate is over. It's not fish oil or krill oil. It's both. And now it's free. Just pay $4.95 for shipping and claim your free bottle. Call now. 800-712-8055. 800-712-8055. That's 800-712-8055. Wow, your flowers are gorgeous. What's your secret? It's no secret. It's Bear Advanced. You mean these blue bottles? Uh Uh-huh. I protect my beauties with all-in-one rose and flower care. It's insect and disease control plus fertilizer. Really? What's this 12-month tree and shrub protect and feed? Oh, I use it on my trees. It kills bugs for up to a year, plus it feeds. It's that easy. Hey, where are you going? To get my own. I want a great yard, too. Bear Advanced. Get more from the blue bottle. Always read and follow label instructions. If only Jason would have stopped before turning. But he didn't. Actually, he didn't even slow down. Or look, if he had, he would have seen the woman in the crosswalk. One in every four traffic fatalities involves a pedestrian. So please stop before turning right on red and always yield for pedestrians. Safety doesn't happen by accident. Alert today, alive tomorrow. A message from the Florida Department of Transportation. This is the Florida Roundtable, a service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks. I'm Reagan Smith, Public Affairs Director of the Florida News Network. And I'm Executive Producer Michael Yaffe. Michael, a pleasure to be with you. And uh, we are in that part of the summer where we observe the anniversary of the United States Independence. And uh, this year, on Independence Day, we are in the midst of the 75th anniversary of World War II. Yes, of course, it dragged on for several years, but we are observing the 75th anniversary of that war. And we're going to focus on that today with some Florida veterans and a Florida author, a, a remarkable story. But I had a couple of thoughts, and I know I, I want to have you share a couple of things. Bob Dole, former senator from Kansas, former Senate majority leader, a minority leader, he's, he's done it all. Uh, Bob Dole, 1996 Republican candidate for president, he is now 94 years old, and he is still with us, pretty much confined to a wheelchair. He was the last <clears throat> of the World War II veterans to run for president. And at age 94, Bob Dole has a, a role that he likes to embrace. He greets our aging World War II veterans every Saturday at the World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C., and as I was, t- we were talking about this, you actually, a couple of seasons back, got to experience that. Yeah, it was just a few years ago because with the local radio station here in Orlando, I got to go with the vets on one of their honor flights up to Washington, D.C., where they take veterans for free to see the memorials in D.C., and we went to the World War II Memorial, and Bob Dole was there. He yeah. was sitting in his wheelchair and he was greeting all the vets, 
And I remember being stunned. I mean, I had no idea he was going to be there. I had no idea that he um, did that on a weekly basis. And I didn't know until you told me this morning that he still does it. Yes, he does. I mean, he he really can't walk. He can barely move. He's 94, like you said, but he appreciates the veterans so much to greet them. I just... It gave me a lot of respect mm-hmm. for Bob Dole. It was really quite something to be able to meet him. Absolutely. And they make a point now that he's able to get ready a little bit faster because he does allow a valet to help him get dressed. You know, he, he basically lost the use of his right arm yeah. in, in World War II and his right shoulder, and uh, it's tough. And he now is pretty much confined to his wheelchair. But he is out there every Saturday to let these veterans know uh, that there are people who still care. They do. And I I think that's terribly important. And at 90, boy, we should make it to 94 and be that healthy, even with his wounds, you know. It's, It's, people tend to forget that this was a horrible time. The world had imploded. And I, again, I don't think that's too strong of a term. It imploded. There were people out there on both sides of the globe who absolutely hated us, who yeah. wanted to subject us. And uh, you and I, you know, had it not been for the greatest generation, Bob Dole's generation, those people who are now reaching into their 90s, um, they put on the uniform and, and they went and they saved us. Yeah. And if it had not been for those people, you and I might be sitting here today talking German. Right. Talking Japanese. <laughs> or we just wouldn't be here. That's exactly, that's my final line. And then yeah. more, more likely we wouldn't be here at all. And uh, so we do owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to these people. Uh, and and uh, this is a marvelous time to acknowledge that around the anniversary of our independence. And uh, I, I think that's terribly important. Well, we have come across a fine piece of writing by an Orlando author, Carol Engel Avriette, uh, another Orlando uh, resident who born and raised in Live Oak, Captain George W. Starks. He was a World War II B-17 pilot with the Mighty Eighth, did a lot of his training in Florida, was shot down and escaped and came back. It is a remarkable story. Uh, our friends at Regnery History have put it together and it is available at all the fine bookstores around Florida and places like Amazon.com. Who knows? Hollywood might come beckoning. You never know. But we're going to talk about that. I'm Reagan Smith. And I'm Michael Yaffe. The Florida Roundtable continues in a moment. Have you written a book? You can become a published author with Dorrance Publishing, the nation's oldest publishing services company. Countless authors have trusted Dorrance for nearly 100 years to bring their book to the market. Our professional team will edit your text, design your book pages, and create an appealing, eye-catching custom cover. Plus, our authors benefit from a custom book promotion marketing campaign that makes your book available where people buy books like Amazon and brick and mortar bookstores. So make this free call right now to claim your free author's guide to publishing. Don't wait another day. Take one step closer to realizing your dream of becoming a published author and seeing your name in print. You've already written a book, so the next thing to do is make this free call right now to Dorn's Publishing and get your free guide to publishing. Call right now. 800-485-6003. 800-485-6003. Six zero zero three. That's eight hundred four eight five six zero zero three. In a world of tiny tomatoes and backyard pests, one man and his better half dig deep to save backyard gardens. Tony, stand by to upload expert videos. Already loaded, Tom. Wow, you're good. You're not so bad yourself. Tom and Joni McCubbin star in hisandhersgardening.com. Critics rave. Tom and Joni, they really grow on you. Two green thumbs up. Don't miss hisandhersgardening.com. Precious Rose, you color our world till insects and disease turn it upside down. So we've created Bear Advanced All-in-One Rose and Flower Care. It's the no-spray formula that works three ways, controlling bugs and disease as it feeds for brighter, more vibrant flowers. So count your blessings and stop to smell the scientific advances. Available in easy-to-use liquid and granules. Bear Advanced. Better science, better results. BearAdvanced.com. Always read and follow label directions. 
We are back. You're listening to the Florida Roundtable, the service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks. I'm Regan Smith. And I'm Michael Yaffe. And Michael, as promised at this point in the program, we are joined by Carol Engel Avriette. Uh, she is the author of Coffin Corner Boys. It is a story of Captain George W. Starks, a World War II B-17 pilot, the Mighty Eight. And uh, it is a marvelous book from our friends at Regnery History. And I might uh, up front say that Carol and Captain Starks both reside in the Orlando area. And uh, Captain Starks, as uh, a matter of fact, was born in Live Oak. But we'll come back to that. Carol, welcome to the Florida Roundtable. Thank you so much, Reagan. It's great to be with you. Well, let us, uh, before we get into the uh, story here, how about taking a minute or two and, and telling us a little bit about you and uh, your writing background and education, how you ended up uh, in Orlando? All right. Well, I uh, had been writing all my life. I began really very young, just putting little sentences together that continued on through high school and writing speeches uh, for oratorical contests. And, and then, of course, I um, had um, undergraduate majors in English, in history, and I specialized in military history and art. And when I was 30, I got a wonderful career break. I was hired as a writer for Southern Living Magazine. Some of your listeners may know that publication. I worked with them uh, interviewing people and, and writing their stories for about 14 and a half years. And then moved to Florida, became editor-in-chief of a Florida lifestyle award-winning lifestyle magazine, did some work with Disney. And the last several years, I've concentrated on writing books. And my, my passion all through my writing career has really been to interview people and then to write their stories. And with my, my background in military history, um, and also I have a family that is steeped in, in uh, many, many people that were with significant uh, uh, placements in in various world wars, particularly World War II, that has created an intersection between my passion of interviewing people and writing, and also my love of military history. So, this this particular book just fits all of those things that that are really the things that I'm the most passionate about. Well, now earlier on, I had mentioned that Captain George Starks uh, was born in Live Oak and and now resides in the Orlando area. And that in itself, uh, being in the Orlando area, is, is a story. How did you come to be acquainted with Captain well, Starks? Well, that's, a, that, that's kind of a little bit of a funny story. Um, my husband had known him professionally for years. But um, my husband has a wonderful fishing buddy that happened to have heard George Starks give his story at a, um, a civic uh, meeting one one time, and so my my husband comes home and he says, you know, he says um, my fishing buddy is is a great story uh, that George Starks has. He said you ought to call him and and see what it's all about. And he knew I was you know casting nets for um, uh, uh, my next book project, and so I called George, um, be, talked to him, and Reagan within five minutes. I knew this was what I wanted to do and that it would just be an incredible story that people would love. And I, I, I worked on it about three years. And, um, of course, the book now has come to fruition, and we're thrilled with it, and I think, I think people will love reading, uh, reading the story. And, of course, for, for all of us you know, that, that live here in Florida, this is, a, this is a Florida boy. As you said, he was, he was born and raised in Live Oak. Um, in fact, he was the band captain up there, and his his uh, high school sweetheart was the head major majorette. He used to goose her with his trombone. He told me <laughs> when they would march in the high school bands, and um, they met when they were twelve years old and sixteen. And the book, of course, uh, also has Betty Jo in it and, and some of their trips back to Europe. But I get ahead of myself a little bit here. But anyway, they, it is a, he, is a, he is an American treasure, and he is a Floridian treasure. So, And um, he's a major part of the book, but you actually, there are other uh, people he was with when uh, the plane went down. Was it hard to uh, track down everyone involved in this book? Well, um, that's a great question. George had done such an amazing job after the war of keeping up 
with his crew. In fact, when he was shot down, he made two vows to himself. Now, the first vow, he said, if I, if I live through this and get back to the States after the war, I will never lose contact with my crew again. The second vow that he made was that if he got, got back alive, one day he would go back and track down all these people in France who had risked their lives to, to help him and help his crew. And George has lived to do both of those things. So when I met George, he had names, family names of all of his crew. Uh, in fact, one other of the crew was still living when I began my research. And so I was able to talk to him personally many times before he passed away. So it's an interesting thing. This crew of 10, B-17s flew with a crew of 10 men. And in this case, they were all young men, and that's a, another story we can talk about in a few minutes. But they were from all over the country, all different backgrounds, all different socioeconomic religions, different in every way, and yet they were united in this purpose of of what they were doing. So from that standpoint, it is a, it is a great story of young men coming together for a very, very good patriotic cause. Well, before we get into their personal stories, I want you to explain, because a lot of folks probably don't know, the title of the book, Coffin Corner Boys. How, you, you've got to explain that for the listeners. Okay. Um, yes. Um, the B-17s, when they flew on their missions in formation, they used what's called a bomber box formation. And within, and of course, each of the each of the positions were numbered. And so, in the low squadron, low group, the number six position was the outside corner. And because it was low squadron, low group, outside corner, it was very vulnerable. The German fighters could come in; they would fly over the formation and could dive up and underneath and strike this outside corner. Well, it, it, that particular position in the bomber box formation, the crews realized very quickly how vulnerable it was and how many planes they lost in that position. And the crews themselves in World War II nicknamed it the Coffin Corner. And so when I began interviewing George, he kept talking about, well, the morning of March 16, 1944, we were assigned the Coffin Corner. And he kept talking about it, and I said, well, George, I, you know, of course, he explained to me what that meant. I said, well, George, you guys were no more than just the Coffin Corner boys. And we laughed a little bit about it, and I said, George, you know what? That's what we need to title this book. And so it just stuck, and we've, ca we've called it that, of course, ever since. And isn't that pretty much exactly what happened to them, although, you know, he was able to survive uh, it was that corner, and one of the German planes kind of came out of nowhere on them, right? Came out of nowhere. It was a uh, FW-190, Focke Wolf 190. Um, one of the uh, the tail gunner thinks that he spotted as he was flipping back around, but these, these FW-190s were so fast, uh, 400 miles per hour, very fast, very maneuverable. And they could just, you know, come in and strike so quickly. In fact, and we talk about this in the book, we think we know which German fighter pilot. He was an ace. Um, and we have his name in the book and even a picture of him. We, we believe that we have identified the very German fighter pilot ace that, that shot George. Uh, nailed his number one engine. It flamed out, and the flames began to spread up the wing. And, of course, as a result, they had to pull out of the formation, and they had to all bail out. And um, so, you know, it was um, that in and of itself. Can you even imagine? George received his pilot wings when he was 19 years old. He was barely 20 when this incident happened. Four of these ten men were, were just 20 years old. The oldest was 27, and they called him Pappy. They thought he was so ancient. Um, you, you know, you think of the responsibility of these young men, uh, what they had carrying, you know, the weight of what they carried on their shoulders, the, and the courage and the bravery that they showed. It's really, it's, for, for that age, for that age, young man, is that not incredible? Hey, Carol, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to elaborate on that point. I want you to for a, a minute or two. 
Uh, and that is, as you just said, he was just 19 uh, when World War II came along. And these are the fellas that fought the war, 18, 19, 20 years old. 27 was Pappy, mm-hmm. and that, that was old. These are the kids who grew up through the Depression, many of them not knowing where their next meal was going to come from, or whether they're going to have a roof over their heads. And when this crisis came along, by God, they put on the uniform, and, and they went and they saved civilization. And I don't think that that's putting it too strongly. No, I, I, I don't either. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right about that. I, um, a few years ago, Tom Hanks or maybe someone else said that World War II is, is the event where a few million people got together to fight and defeat evil. And these ten young men, we, we have the stories, as you have mentioned, about each one of them in here. But as soon as they heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, they immediately... Uh, George George hitchhiked uh, all the way to Orlando to take his test and, and to try to sign up. And his his reaction was very similar to all these others. They, they knew immediately what they wanted to do, uh, what they had to do. And, and they did it willingly. They did it gladly. They, I'll tell you, they did it with an exuberance of youthfulness. Um, and, and, and they were magnificent. In, in their uh, their confidence, they were magnificent in their commitment to this country. It, it's it's really they they're not called the greatest generation for nothing. I'll tell you. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, that was one thing that kind of struck me because you have some pictures in the book, like you said earlier, and I was looking at the pictures and I noticed as well that they they're very young. Mm. There, I mean, to, to go through an experience like that at such a young age um, must have been incredible. It, it really must have. I, I know I, um, I, you know, I think even now we, 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 we have, we are so blessed in our country. And we, we truly have um, such incredible resources. We have such incredible um uh, opportunities um, and these young men basically put all of that on the line Carol I tell you what hold your thought because the clock has caught us here we're going to have to take a break along our network line here and remind folks that they're listening to the Florida Roundtable the service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks I'm Reagan Smith and I'm Michael Yaffe our very special guest this day Carol Engel Avriette she's the author of Coffin Corner Boys, and we'll continue our conversation in a moment. The National Weather Service is predicting another busy hurricane season for the state of Florida. But this season, you have an option to protect yourself with Storm Peace. This affordable parametric insurance covers you where your homeowner's insurance doesn't. Mobile homeowners and renters are eligible, too. Storm Peace offers customers a painless claims process. No deductibles, no adjusters, and fast payouts. Use the money for any hurricane-related expense, generator costs, food spoilage replacement, or repairs to detached structures, even evacuation costs. Visit StormPeace.com to receive a quote or chat with an agent today. Your yard's days of being picked on are over. Thanks to the science of Bear Advanced Brush Killer Plus. It's penetrating formula specifically designed to kill hard-to-control brush like kudzu, poison ivy, poison oak, and wild berries. Roots and all. And the concentrate product even kills stumps. So your yard never has to worry about being bullied. Bear Advanced. Get more from the Blue Bottle. BearAdvanced.com. Always read and follow label directions. One time, he forgot to fuel up the boat. And it wouldn't be the first time he left his tackle box behind. On one trip, he even headed out without his lucky hat. And seems he almost always forgets to wear his sunscreen. But he never forgets to wear the one thing that could save his life. Life jackets save lives. Wear it, Florida. Visit myfwc.com for more information. Is your yard a glorious utopia? One that deserves protection from the invasion of Blackberry? If so, then your passion is our passion. That's why Bayer Advanced has made Brush Killer Plus. It uses a systemic formula that kills Blackberry to the root. And it's now available in a new 1.3 gallon ready to use pump sprayer, making it even easier to apply. Brush Killer Plus from Bayer Advanced. Your passion is our passion. 
Visit BayerAdvance.com. Always read and follow label directions. Leaving tobacco behind isn't an easy task. In all honesty, it's a very hard thing to do. The good news is, if you want to quit, Tobacco Free Florida offers free help, support, and the tools you'll need to succeed. Area health education centers offer free classes that are run by professionals who know what you're up against. It's comforting to have a face-to-face conversation with a person who knows exactly what you're going through as you begin your quit journey. If you've tried to quit tobacco before, or if you've been avoiding trying to quit, now is the right time for you to succeed. Area Health Education Centers offer free classes that are designed to help you quit and offer free nicotine replacement therapy like patches, lozenges, and gum. Remember, it's free, so you have nothing to lose. There's a quitter in you, and with the help of Tobacco Free Florida's three ways to quit, you'll double your chances of success. If you or someone you know needs help quitting tobacco, you can call 1-877-YOU-CAN-NOW or visit us at TobaccoFreeFlorida.com. We tend to focus on the material and the temporal and neglect the eternal and relational. But none of us knows the number of days that God has planned for us. Don't put off until tomorrow the really important things you can do today, like getting right with God and getting right with others. God became a man in the person of Jesus to show us how. Start by getting right with God through Jesus. Then show your family how much you love them. If you're married or a parent, surprise them by occasionally coming home early. Tell them you love them. Plan fun things to do with them. Help someone you care about, someone who needs you at the office or in the neighborhood, or maybe someone who needs a friend. Maybe just be someone to listen and hold a hand. Even seek to be right with those who are not for you. It may not be the last day that you live here on earth, but it may become a great day for you and those you care about. This is Bryant Wright, speaking right from my heart. Visit rightfromtheheart.org. That's rightfromtheheart.org. From Pensacola to Key West and all points in between, you're listening to the Florida Roundtable, a service of Florida's Talk and Entertainment Networks. I'm Regan Smith. And I'm Michael Yaffe. Our very special guest this day, Carol Engel Avriat, the author of Coffin Corner Boys with Captain George W. Starks, both residents uh, of Orlando. And Carol, uh, as we came to the end of that last segment, you were talking about the spirit of, of the young men and how this country is blessed, and I wanted to give you a chance to finish that thought. Well, we were just, uh, of course, I was just referring to the fact that all ten of these young men coming from such different backgrounds and uh, different family uh, situations, different religions even, came together in such an incredible spirit uh, of patriotism and commitment to the country and just laid aside everything else in order to to join up, and they did whatever they could. I mentioned that George hitchhiked all the way to Orlando just to take his test and and um, and, and try to get into um, the Army Air. It was called the Army Air Corps at that time, but um, so it was an amazing thing. And particularly when you consider, you know, how young they were. I would. I was taken uh, while reading this. Early on in the war, uh, Ronald Reagan was at Warner Brothers with people like Errol Flynn and other folks, and they made a war movie where Reagan and Flynn were flying for the British. Uh, I think it was called Perilous Journey, and some movie fans may remember this thing, but I was taken by the similarities. They are shot down in Germany, and it's, it's a story... And there's some, there are some light-hearted moments in it. They, they escape, uh, but it's across Germany and Holland and France. And I was drawn to this, and I, and I want you to, we don't want to give away too much of the book here, you know, but um, it, it is a remarkable story of survival. Well, it, well, it is, and it's so funny. We, so many people that have read the book have, have commented or said, you know, gosh, this would make a great movie. And so we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens along those lines. But what, what happened was when the, when the plane was shot down, when the B-17 was shot down, they were in northern France. They had almost made it into Germany where their target was actually located, but they were shot down over northern France, And because the plane, you know, is still continuing to move forward, then as they parachute out, obviously they are spread out over a large swath of French countryside. And almost immediately, two of them 
were captured by the gendarme and then turned into some German soldiers. Two others later were captured. So four were taken as POWs, four out of the ten. Two then um, were able to kind of connect up together after a few days and wound up hooking up with the French underground. And they eventually were able, after some very, very tight, uh, harrowing experiences to walk out through the Pyrenees and into Spain. Three of them also were able to hook out, and they hook up together, and they were able to walk out and into Switzerland. George was the one that was alone. He was the pilot. He was the last man to parachute out. And he, his story is really remarkable. He broke his foot, a uh, hairline fracture in his foot when he landed. He landed so hard and had shrapnel from the uh, the shooting when the plane was shot, had shrapnel in his thigh, and he still, with the help of these incredible French people, was able to walk about 300 miles into Switzerland, but not without one incident, incredible incident after another. And that was one thing uh, that really struck me in the book, is there seemed to be a lot of French people who were willing to help these pilots. Well, well, I- Absolutely. You know, sometimes you hear about um, maybe maybe those that were uh, sympathetic to the Germans, and yes, th- there, that was the case. There were many, but you, it seems to me in my research, you found many of those in like you're in the, the Paris area. But once you got out into the countryside, the villagers, the townspeople, were adamantly opposed. To these Germans that had come in. Now, I will I will say, and there are a couple of incidents like this in the book. There were some that were so scared, they just could not bring themselves to help, you know, the the airmen. But George always understood that. He said, "My goodness, you know, they they would have lost their lives had they been caught." So I mean, he said, "It wasn't exactly like you know they were they they'd be blessed by the Germans if they were caught helping these guys." There would have been severe consequences, if not death. So it really took a great deal of courage. But time and time again, you will see in the book how just average, the average man, average woman, and children, French, helped them, uh, maybe with some food, maybe with a shelter for, for the night, maybe with clothing. And it really is remarkable what they did, how they risk everything to help our guys. It, it is, and uh, down to directions and whatnot. And in many cases, uh, a Frenchman caught helping uh, an escapee like this, it could mean instant death, not only for that person, but for the entire family. Oh. And you didn't know because there were people who went both ways, and there were those who could serve as informants on their neighbors. So, I mean, this is a very, very treacherous journey we're talking about here very very treacherous very tricky um and you they would come they would meet up say finally george met up with someone that actually was with the resistance um in fact he was a spy for british intelligence but he himself was very careful who he would trust um they you know you like you say you, you you really didn't know who you could trust and you had you just had to be so very careful and and you see that play out numerous times in the book a couple of them um this, this one french couple hid hid him in the attic with three or four other airmen that he didn't know and he wasn't certain that a couple of those other airmen weren't german spies themselves you know they did that they they would take the ones that could speak english so well or were actually from america had returned to germany to fight um, and they would infiltrate uh, uh, sometimes even the POW camps to find out, you know, what was going on and who was trying to do this and do that. So very treacherous, as you say, very tricky. Yeah, one thing you mention a few times in the book is the French underground. Uh, what did you learn about the French underground in doing the research for this book? Well, you you actually had three or four organized groups working in France. The French underground was just one of those groups, but one of the primary groups. You also had another group, the French resistance. That was a different group from the underground. You had another group called the Maquis. That was yet again um, another uh, group 
that were working uh, in conjunction with others of, you know, like mind to uh, combat this German occupation. And it was very difficult to, to hook up with them because they had to be careful, too. Uh, you know, the Germans were trying to find out who they were so that they could either execute them or, or torture them or, or, or put them into concentration camps. So um, always, always you had to be mindful of who you trusted, who you said what to. Um, we have some. We have we have one time when they were sitting. A couple of them were sitting on a, a bench outside a train station and wondering what on earth and who to trust and where to go. And somebody came up behind them. They never knew who this was, and said, "Boys, I'd get the heck." But of course, that's not what he said. I get the heck out of here. There are Germans all around in perfect English, and so they did, but they never knew who it was. It was just perhaps another airman or maybe someone working with the underground that spotted them and uh, gave them that tip that they were about to get caught. So they, of course, immediately left the train station, but you had things like that happen all the time. At one point in the story, you have Captain Starks refer to a man as the bravest man I've ever known, and I want you to share that story. Yes, yes. Well, George had relied on villagers and so on and so forth, but in order to actually cross the border from France into Switzerland, the border was heavily patrolled by the Germans, uh, the guards and, and, and uh, police dogs and so on and so forth. And he knew, he knew he would have to hook up with a prof- you know, somebody that was actually in one of the organized groups in order to make that crossing. And finally, at long last, I won't tell you how, because that is an incredible story. You will we'll get your uh, listeners to read that. But he finally hooked up with a man named Maurice Bavarel. And Maurice was working for British intelligence. And through Maurice's connections, George was able to, Maurice helped George actually get across the border. And that is hair-raising. But he said that Maurice would just walk right through the Germans. Of course, he, you know, was French, and he was uh, had a swagger, and, and uh, he hated the Germans. He'd already been imprisoned by them a couple of times, I and mean, they had already tortured him. And so he had some very, um, very uh, definite feelings about, uh, about the Germans and what they were doing in his country. And Tar- Carol, tell you what, hold, and we're going to have to ask you to hold that thought again. We need to remind folks that they are listening to the Florida Roundtable, the service of Florida's Talk and Entertainment Networks. I'm Reagan Smith. And I'm Michael Yaffe. Our very special guest today is Carol Engel Avriette. And uh, the story of Captain George W. Starks, as recorded in Coffin Corner Boys. It's from our friends at Regnery History. It's available at all the fine bookstores around Florida and places like Amazon.com. And if you'll stay put, the conversation continues following these messages. What is truth? And where can we find it? Truth is not found in a man-made philosophy or ideology, but it's found in a person, the person of Jesus. In our politically correct society, we need the truth now more than ever. So many put their trust in a preconceived ideology. The result is that truth is subjective. We don't know what to believe. But here's how you can know what is true. Jesus is truth. The truth of God is revealed in Jesus through the Bible. The more we read God's Word and trust it and apply it to our everyday lives, the more we begin to discover the truth that is in Christ Jesus. How can we do this when so many cultural norms seem to contradict Jesus and God's Word? By trusting in Jesus, He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You want to know the truth? Get to know Jesus. This is Brian Wright, speaking the truth right from my heart. Wow, your flowers are gorgeous. What's your secret? It's no secret. It's Bear Advanced. You mean these blue bottles? Uh Uh-huh. I protect my beauties with all-in-one rose and flower care. It's insect and disease control plus fertilizer. Really? What's this 12-month tree and shrub protect and feed? Oh, I use it on my trees. It kills bugs for up to a year, plus it feeds. It's that easy. Hey, where are you going? To get my own. I want a great yard, too. Bear Advanced. Get more from the blue bottle. Always read and follow label instruction. Years after her husband first arrived in Belle Glade, Florida from Haiti, Stephanie finally had her family together again. But her husband and daughter became disabled. So now, Stephanie supports them, working brutal 15-hour days in the farm fields. 
At the Glades Initiative, we connect Stephanie and others with food and social services. Help us help them have decent lives together. Visit gladesinitiative.org. We are back. You're listening to the Florida Roundtable, a service of Florida's Talk and Entertainment Networks. I'm Reagan Smith. And I'm Michael Yaffe. Our very special guest this day is author Carol Engel Avriette in Orlando. She has written the story of the corner, Coffin Corner Boys, Captain George W. Starks, who also resides in Orlando at age 94. He was a World War II B-17 pilot. And Carol, when we took that break, uh, George had been talking about the bravest man he ever known, and I wanted to let you finish that story. Yes, well, that turned out to be, um, he finally was able to hook up with uh, a fellow from the French um, resistance. He was a British spy. Or, no, he was French, but he was spying for the British, and his name was Maurice Bavarel. And uh, Maurice was able to actually accompany George through the mountains. Now, I will tell you this. This is funny. <laughs> Maurice was a skier, of course, very, very fine skier. And mostly he took these these people or families that he was trying to get out of France and into Switzerland through the mountains, and they would ski through these passes. So he, he kept asking George, he said, George, do you ski? And George would say, well, yes, I, I water ski. I'm from Florida, but I've never even seen snow before. <laughs> so that, that he, that Maurice knew immediately that that was not going to work with George. So they found, uh, they found some other ways to get, to get George out. But um, they struck up such a friendship, Reagan, and this is another part of this story uh, that I'd like to share with your listeners because in Florida this is, this is really cool and really neat. When he went back to Europe for the first time, 25 years after the war, he determined to try to locate as many of these French people that had helped him as he could. And before he left, he, the mayor at that time was Carl Langdon in Orlando, and he met with Carl, Mayor Langdon. And Mayor Langdon came up with the idea of creating some brass keys that George would take. And if he found anyone, he said, George, make them I give you the, I'll, well, I'll do the paperwork and take care of all of that. He said, I want them, I want you to honor them by becoming honorary citizens of Orlando, Florida. And, and that is exactly what George did. He found nearly every person that had helped him, presented each one of them. He took 12 keys with him, presented each one of them with a brass key. And then in later years, he went back several more times, and then he started having them come here. He he would help pay for their their tickets, their airline tickets, because they couldn't afford the, the cost. He would pay for them to come here. And so he paid for Maurice and his wife to come and visit Orlando, and they uh, had meetings down at at City Hall, I mean, and the, and the commissioner and all, and with the mayor's group. And so, so Maurice finally got to his dream, and that was to come to the United States and to, uh, to, to be here in Florida with, with, with Floridians, and we gave them evidently a great, great welcome. So as you mentioned earlier, not all of them were able to get out. Some were captured and put into POW camps. Talk a little bit about their experiences. Well, that was really quite quite something. Um, three of them were officers, and they went to Stalag Luft Three. One was enlisted, and he was captured and went to Stalag Luft Four. The Germans separated the officers and the enlisted men in separate camps. They were very very conscious in their uh, their military uh, about those kinds of things, and and all four of them had some really harrowing experiences. But the one that was the enlisted, um, he was the tail gunner, Dick Morse. He wound up in Stalag Love 4, which was one of the, the really more difficult of the POW camps, up on the clo- very close to the Baltic Sea. And toward the end of the war, he actually was a, um, a forced participant in what has, been com- has become known as the Black Death March. Very, very, li- very little about that. Very underreported. A very underreported World War II event, and we have firsthand account and firsthand account of that Black Death March. lasted 86 days in the dead of winter, and little food. Uh, I think only about one out of six or seven of the POWs survived. 
that march. Very similar in in its um, uh, the the working out of it to the Bataan Death March. Not not quite as severe, but but certainly harrowing. And it was it was just in uh, just a horrible situation. And like I say. Uh, one of one of the ten was actually on that on that march, and we have those firsthand stories um, in in the book, Coffin Corner Boys. It is uh, part of this book, the the captured ones, and you do have the lower side, the underside, if you will, of the war. There are the descriptions uh, of the of the death camps. Uh, you know that I don't know how people do it today. There are folks who say, oh, it never happened. That's why General Eisenhower had the films made, so that we would have the documentation. You have those things in there. It is a very honest portrayal of, of all of these things. But, uh, Carol, what I, what I want to ask you, really, um, number one, how long did it take you to put all of this together? Well, I, I started interviewing George um, about three and a half years ago, maybe even a little bit longer. And as you can imagine, uh, we are working with 10 people and 10 different stories. So I, I went to all of the families, um, got tapes. Some of them t- had tapes of their loved ones, their dads, um, that had, uh, you know, where they'd been given maybe presentations in a school or something like that, a civic club. I had diaries. I had journals. So you had to work all of that together. And then, of course, you, you, had, you do have to check because... Memories can, you know, can, can dull some and, and uh, memories fade and exact dates and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of, you know, crossover in trying to make sure you've got your dates and all of that correct. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yes, about three and a half years is, is about it took me to do it. Carol, we only have about a, a minute or so left here, and this is probably not a fair question to ask with only a minute to go. But... What do you hope, in your heart of hearts, what do you want your readers to take away from this story? Well, I'll tell you, I had someone ask me um, not long ago, to whom was the audience? Who was who I writing this book, two and four? And, and obviously, it's for people who love, uh, you know, the history of our country, love military history, and so on and so forth. But I will tell you, Reagan, a group of people that I wrote this book for are people just like my grandchildren because I want them to know what was done for them in World War II, the sacrifices that were made. Um, These ten young men came back, not without scars, but there were many others who did not come back. And they fought for our freedom. They fought for our country. They fought for the, 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 the belief systems that we have here in this great country. And so, yes, for those people who are interested in World War II history, this book is for them. But it is also for the younger generation to record the stories of these of these very brave, courageous young men. Well said, Carol, and unfortunately we're going to have to leave it there. But Carol Engel Avriette, Coffin Corner Boys, it is from our friends at Regnery History. We hope that you'll pick it up and give it a give it a read. Five stars from here, Carol. Thank you so much for your time this day, and we hope you'll come back and visit again. Thank you so much. God bless. This is the Florida Roundtable. I'm Reagan Smith. And I'm Michael Yaffe. And a brief closing thought following these messages. Right now, Wet and Forget Outdoor is cleaning that black and green stuff off all my outdoor surfaces. With Wet and Forget Outdoor, you just spray it on, and every time it rains, it cleans. Moss, mold, mildew, and algae don't stand a chance on my siding, deck, and pavers, even the fabric on my patio umbrella. Outdoor cleaning is as easy as Wet and Forget. Make cleaning easier. Pick up Wet and Forget today at Lowe's Home Improvement Stores or visit wetandforget.com to find a store near you. Your yard's days of being picked on are over. Thanks to the science of Bear Advanced Brush Killer Plus, its penetrating formula is specifically designed to kill hard-to-control brush like kudzu, poison ivy, poison oak, and wild berries, roots and all. And the concentrate product even kills stumps, so your yard never has to worry about being bullied. Bear Advanced. Get more from the Blue Bottle. BearAdvanced.com. Always read and follow label directions.
Do you have a family emergency plan for hurricane season? Make sure you know how to receive weather alerts, like local radio and TV stations, weather radios, and cell phone apps. If you plan to shelter in place, prepare the safest interior room in your house. If evacuating, locate the nearest public shelters and make a list of any special items that you may need, like medicines and important documents. This hurricane preparedness tip has been brought to you by Storm Peace Hurricane Protection. This affordable supplemental insurance covers you where your homeowner's insurance doesn't. Visit stormpeace.com for your quote today. Guilt. To most, it's just a word. But if you hit or worse kill a pedestrian while driving, guilt becomes your shadow, following you every day for the rest of your life. And let's be honest, you have a lot of life left to live. So please, stop before turning right on red and always yield for pedestrians. Because safety doesn't happen by accident. Alert today, alive tomorrow. A message from the Florida Department of Transportation. In a world of tiny tomatoes and backyard pests, one man and his better half dig deep to save backyard gardens. Tony, stand by to upload expert videos. Already loaded, Tom. Wow, you're good. You're not so bad yourself. Tom and Joni McCubbin star in hisandhersgardening.com. Critics rave. Tom and Joni, they really grow on you. Two green thumbs up. Don't miss hisandhersgardening.com. Employ Florida offers resources and services to help you find employment. Hi, Gary here. Employ Florida helped me improve my interview skills, plus write a great resume. I attended networking events with many employers and other industry professionals just like me. With the workshops and training found at EmployFlorida.com, I was able to land a great job in my field. Job resources. Real results. Hired. EmployFlorida.com. That's EmployFlorida.com. We are back. You're listening to the Florida Roundtable, the service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks. I'm Reagan Smith. And I'm Michael Yaffe. And, uh, Michael, I enjoyed listening to Carol Aviette uh, tell the story of George Starks and the Coffin Corner Boys. I don't think we gave away too much of it. We want folks to go Oh, no, there's so <laughs> much more in that book. <laughs> it, so much more. It, it really is a marvelous book. And one of the points that I think needs to be made before we part company today Uh, And that is, this happens near the end of the war. 1945 was the worst year in the history of the world. More people killed, more buildings destroyed than any other year in recorded history. And it was the climax of the United States taking the best of its young men and sending them halfway around the world in both directions, not to conquer not to terrorize, not to murder or rape, but to liberate. Yeah. They went out, they put on those uniforms, these kids who many, as I said earlier, didn't know where their next meal was coming from. They put on the uniform and they went out and they saved the world. And I don't think that that's putting it a bit too strongly. I so, don't either. Well, we hope you have enjoyed our conversation today and we do say thank you for your time. We know that uh, you have lots of choices out there, uh, up and down the dial and everywhere else. So Mike and I really do appreciate your company. This is the Florida Roundtable. I'm Reagan Smith. And I'm Michael Yaffe. We'll see you again in one week. You've been listening to the Florida Roundtable, a news and public affairs presentation of the Florida News Network. The views and opinions expressed during this show are solely those of the participants and not necessarily those of this station's management, ownership, or sponsors. Please email your comments to Reagan Smith at FNNonline.net.